It's May 31st, that means it's time for a new 31 on 31. Today we're gonna rank Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit, Star Wars, Harry Potter, and The Chronicles of Narnia all together, 31 movies on the 31st. So let's talk about it. My name is Sean and I love to talk about movies and TV way too much. With that in mind, go ahead and join me down below in the comment section. Share your ranking of all 31 movies or as many as you've seen from the worst to the best. My list isn't the right list. It's just my list and I would love to see yours. With that in mind, 31 on 31 is a series of the Autop stream. That means Cody Leach and Brian Lomax will also be sharing their list today. Once you've watched mine, you can check out theirs right up here. The links will also be down below in the description. One final thing before we get started, I have done some re-evaluating of some of the movies that I've previously ranked, so I have moved quite a few things around, and let's get started. Coming in in last place, Fantastic Beasts, The Crimes of Grindelwald. Now, I'm not the biggest Harry Potter fan. My wife absolutely loves the books and the movies and is getting my kids into them, and I'm perfectly fine with that, but it's not a series I've ever naturally gravitated towards. And when you add in a movie into the series like this, it just makes it very tedious for someone like me to get through because it's a movie that has 1,000 subplots but lacks a single compelling narrative thread to drive the whole story. Clearly, they have struggled to figure out what they want the Fantastic Beasts franchise to be about. Do they want it to be this whimsical tale for children about Newt trying to track down Fantastic Beasts or do they want it to be about this epic battle between Dumbledore and Grindelwald? And so it does this weird mashup of the two. And in particular with this movie, it simply doesn't work. There's all of these plot threads that go absolutely nowhere. There's a lot of retconning of backstories. There's all sorts of details that don't feel like they fit right. And then they took Credence, who felt like a one and done character in the first movie, that they didn't do anything to set him up as this major player, and then they bring him back and try and tie him into the mythology in a way where you're just like, what on earth is going on here? Why are we making a big deal out of that guy? So this is a perfect example of a movie that's a, a studio really trying to make a franchise into something, but they don't know what they want it to be, and so they try everything and none of it really works. Number 30, The Hobbit, The Battle of the Five Armies. Now, right out of the gate, I was one of those people that just was baffled by the decision to turn The Hobbit into three different movies. I'll go into that more when we talk about one of the other Hobbit films, but it led to this situation where they had to take very small amounts of material in the book and stretch it out to extraordinary lengths. The ultimate example of this would be the Battle of the Five Armies, which in the book is literally this. It's literally three, four pages in the book where Bilbo gets knocked out and then he wakes up the next day and it's over with, and they turned it into a two-hour movie, in which case it's all just cinematic filler, exaggerated to over-the-top proportions, all sorts of battle sequences that just defy any sort of logic or reason. There's a part where they're like running on a bridge while it's collapsing. All of it just looks like a video game turned into a movie, not like anything grounded in some sort of reality. The Hobbit isn't meant to be Lord of the Rings. The Hobbit is meant to be The Hobbit and has a different tone, a different vibe, a different energy and it's not what they tried to make this into. Like this story is a subplot in a different story. It's meant to be the third act of a story, not a story in and of itself, in which case you have a cold open with a dragon that has no payoff. You have a whole subplot 30 minutes in about Gandalf that's just there to set up stuff for the Lord of the Rings, but doesn't really tie into this story. And all sorts of things about fighting over gold that's stretched out way too long. Long, there's just not enough material here to carry a story in and of itself. So it's just fluff and overblown action sequences. Number 29, Star Wars The Last Jedi, the most polarizing Star Wars film. And as you can tell from my placement, I'm on the side that does not like this film. Not every character needs to be deconstructed. Not every piece of mythology needs to be torn apart and plucked apart and thrown all the holes in the mythology. 
Sometimes you want good guys to just be good guys, bad guys to just be bad guys, and to have a nice sense of heroism. That's what Star Wars has always been, and Ryan Johnson wanted to add complexity to it, and I just don't think it fit. And he tried to do it with a character that was the symbol of hope, and then they made him into a cynical old man that tried to kill his nephew because he thought something bad might happen. This is the guy that went to try and redeem Darth Vader, the guy that blew up planets and slaughtered children. He still had hope that guy was okay, but he gave up on his nephew. I just don't buy into it. And I don't think the execution with these flashbacks was very good with the way that it was handled. The main plot is a rehash of Empire Strikes Back with a little bit of Return of the Jedi thrown in there. And this is just some dumb stuff where Rose Tico crashes into Finn in the final battle so that he won't sacrifice himself. I mean, it's like nonsense. Like she crashes into him. She could kill him and herself to stop him from stopping the bad guys. I mean, it's just weird. It's like a movie that is antagonistic towards everything that Star Wars fans like about Star Wars, in which case I don't really appreciate that. There are some gorgeous shots. There's some moments that are nice, but overall, this is the Star Wars film that I'm least likely to want to rewatch the one that stepped on my toes the most and I find the most aggravating. So with almost five years of processing it, it's in last when it comes to my Star Wars ranking. Number 28, Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker. Now, when I first saw this movie, I appreciated it more because it was pandering to me and I appreciated that it was at least trying to deliver what I appreciate about Star Wars. But it's also one of those ones that once the honeymoon phase ended and you can stop and think about what just happened, you're like, Ugh, what on earth did Kathleen Kennedy do to Star Wars? How do you make a trilogy of Star Wars films without a plan? Where each movie seems actively antagonistic towards the one that came before it. Last Jedi wanted to undo Force Awakens, and then Rise of Skywalker really wanted to undo what happened in Last Jedi, in which case there's no cohesive narrative. They had to reset up a new finale at the beginning of this one by having Palpatine starting a podcast. And I don't actually even mind that they brought Palpatine back or that Rey ties into that. It kind of fits into some of the things in Star Wars, but as a last minute course correction, it's a terrible idea executed poorly with a bunch of really taped together plot lines that just tried to make for a cohesive story. But it's just heartbreaking what Star Wars turned into, that this was supposed to be the close of the saga where to make it make sense, they introduced brand new powers where you can bring people back to life or something like that. We've never seen this power before and suddenly we have it just so that we can have Kylo Ren or Ben Solo sacrifice himself to bring back Rey. I mean, it's just <laughs> so heartbreaking. At least it was pandering to me and not antagonistic towards the Star Wars mythology. So I'll inch it out above Last Jedi, but with time to process, the sequel trilogy really broke my heart. Next up, The Hobbit and Unexpected Journey. As I mentioned earlier, from the get-go, I had serious issues with them deciding to convert this book right here into three movies. Previously, they converted this much book into three movies, and they decided to do the same treatment with a single book that's shorter than all three of those. And the consequence of that is that everything has to be too long. Everything has to be expanded upon in order to fill out your epic runtime that you want to do. And you're also taking away what makes The Hobbit unique, which is it's aimed at a more at a younger age. It's meant to be kind of this quick moving little adventure. It's not meant to be a Lord of the Rings epic. It's just not that. It's a much more whimsical little adventure about this guy swept off on a quest to try and get some gold. And you just lose that entirely when you convert it into this other thing. And it's tough to see it as being anything other than for the purpose of making more money. And instead of making one movie that makes a billion dollars, if you make three movies, you get three movies that make a billion dollars but you don't get as good of a product. You don't get as good of an adaptation. You certainly don't get a work of art out of The Hobbit, in which case it's, we're spending way too long in the Shire singing songs. And then every time an action sequence happens, it's supposed to be like a little chase and they escape and things like And everything is just overblown. I would be very interested if someone on the internet made a supercut that took 
all three movies and compacted them into about two and a half hours. That sounds about right to me. Number 26, Star Wars Attack of the Clones. For a long time, this was my least favorite Star Wars movie because I think it just has a, a total lack of a central plot line that's compelling. There's a mystery that isn't all that mysterious. It's not one that you're actually invested in combined with a romance that's not romantic whatsoever that has gone down in history as one of the worst romances in film history while being one of the most important in this incredible Star Wars saga where you do not buy into Anakin and Padme whatsoever. He's a total creep from the first time they meet and then he's talking about sand. <laughs> in the weirdest way possible. And then he slaughters people and says it to her. And she's like, there, there, I'm in love with you. You don't buy into any of it. And all of it leads to a big gigantic fight at the end. And there's some cool action here and there. But I mean, I think there's a lot of um, the worst of what you can do with prequels, tying in Boba Fett into the clones, I think was a terrible idea. And they've gone, had to gone with it. And there's, they've done some fun things because that's what the mythology says. But in and of itself, it's a really just goofy way to like, hey, that guy was there too. Hey, that guy was there too with Boba Fett of all characters. And I, I don't think it's a good idea. It made for a very messy mythology that they've had to try and do stuff with to make it make more sense. And so a movie with a few moments that are kind of cool and a lot of really cringe moments. Number 25, Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. Now, my wife is a Harry Potter fanatic. The book Half-Blood Prince is one of her absolute favorites, but I think this is the movie where they did the worst job of condensing a very large book into a single film runtime, in which case too much got trimmed out, too much got lost in the process, too much was condensed in a way where it just doesn't make for a compelling narrative that flows forward that you can buy into. Too much of the connective tissue was trimmed off throughout the process. And adding to that, they went for a bit too extreme of a visual style. I understand that they were trying to like visually show that as the Dark Lord returns, the world is becoming darker, but it just makes for a very drab, ugly color scheme as you're watching this film. So when you put it all together, you get a movie that's a little bit confusing because they trimmed so much out of it and they're just trying to drop the most important things to tie it all together with an ugly look to it. I just don't think it works all that well, despite having great source material. Then we have The Chronicles of Narnia, Voyage of the Dawn Treader. Now, of the movies on the list, this is the one that I most recently rewatched, which was last night, the final movie that I watched for this list. And I've seen it, I think, a couple times before over the last decade since it came out. And it's always just been like a fine adventure. Like, we're off to the high seas, doing some fun fantasy-type stuff. But there's nothing in particular about it that stands out. There's not an action sequence that's particularly memorable. There's not a character that I resonate with in this particular film. It's just kind of from some fantasy stuff. And the cousin character, played by, what is it, Will Portier, um, he's just so unbelievably annoying that when he turns into a dragon... Even though it's fun to have a dragon on your side, more importantly, he's not whining anymore. So uh, a, a movie that, I guess the other part to it is that it's significantly shorter than the other two adaptations in the series. We felt like they just wanted to make this quick moving little swashbuckling adventure and in the process trimmed away a little bit too much, condensed it too much. So it's just, there's, there's no depth, there's no meat to it, just some fun that moves pretty quickly. Doesn't leave a mark. Didn't offend me. Didn't bother me. I'm not, I don't have much to trash. This is not much to m remember either. Number 23, Star Wars The Phantom Menace. Now, this is a movie that people have been absolutely trashing ever since it came out. There is plenty here to criticize, but I've always found that there's more to this movie than a lot of people give it credit for. I think the basic structure of it works. There's some you know, some great casting, some not so great casting, but like Ewan McGregor, great casting. Everyone is so excited to see him back in Kenobi because he was the right person to play that part. And he still is 
you know, almost 25 years later, Liam Neeson, great actor that can bring some gravitas into the mix. Um, Natalie Portman, obviously gone on to be this long running A-list actress. There's a lot of rock solid casting in here. Dolph, Darth Maul, classic iconic Star Wars villain that makes for one of the most memorable lightsaber battles in the entire franchise. And we have some flaws here too. I mean, Char Jar, not a good character, way too juvenile of humor, got some problems here. And I, like, I get all the criticisms that people have for it. I just wish that they would also give it more credit for the things that it does right. And I actually put out a video on how to fix the Phantom Menace. And I think with just reworking things a little bit, changing the ingredients, this could have been a great Star Wars movie. And I don't think you have to change all that much about it to kind of take it to that next level. 22, Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 1. Now, inherently, I think this movie kind of had the short end of the stick as it's the first half of a epic conclusion, in which case it's all of the setup. It's all of the parts where you're moving everything along without any of the payoff. In which case, for me, as someone that loves payoff, it loses a little bit of the sparkle and the magic. Now, there's it kicks off with a great little chase sequence through the muggle world. The character moments can be very profound. And so if this is, if you're really invested in the world of Harry Potter and the characters, the character work here can be great. But as someone that's not quite as invested into the characters on a story level, it's kind of just a lot of the meandering around, fairly directionless, which is kind of the point of the story, but when that's the whole story, because you divide it into a single movie and it's just all directionless, them going places, trying to figure it out, like, what are we gonna do? That's not the most compelling in and of itself. I also don't think it does a great job of showing the passage of time that in a large amount of time has passed throughout the story. So for me, this is one that in and of itself, I don't think works all that well. And um, I don't know, maybe there's some way they could have reworked the two parts to make for something better. But in and of itself, this one was kind of one of the weaker Harry Potter films. Number 21, The Hobbit, The Desolation of Smaug. Now, as I said before, I'm not the biggest fan of the Hobbit trilogy because it shouldn't be a trilogy. <laughs> it should be one. Maybe, maybe two short films, but instead they decided to turn into three epics that just doesn't fit. And I think this is the one that's the least frustrating for me that feels like it has the most focused story, whereas the first one is way too much. Let's spend a bunch of time getting ready to go on an adventure. And the third one is let's spend way too much time on a final battle that's paying off all this stuff, but it's not really paying off stuff because it's not what The Hobbit was really about. And this is the one that feels like you have the clearest objective, goal, quest that we're on, in which case you go on the journey, you feel like you've fulfilled some purpose in what you're trying to do. Obviously, it's still not even in the top 20, so I'm not crazy about this one either, but of them, this was the one that I got the most enjoyment out of and I found the least kind of exhausting and tedious to watch. Number 20, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. And I'll say this, at this point in time, we're into the category of movies that, that I find good, I find enjoyable, and they're all watchable from henceforth on the list. Uh, when it comes to this movie, I almost want to have it higher because there's so much of this movie that I actually really do enjoy. When this movie is about Newt and the Fantastic Beasts and it's about kind of this childish little adventure about capturing weird creatures and putting them in his briefcase, I think it's a really good spinoff in the world of Harry Potter. But you can feel that tension that's in all of these movies where they can't decide if that's what they want to be or if they want to be about this big epic battle, in which case they have to put Grindelwald in there. And then all this stuff with Credence feels so much heavier and darker than everything with Newt. So you will have Newt on this silly little adventure trying to capture a creature and it's goofy and there's a lot of laps and then they catch it and then we cut to Credence and he's being abused and someone's whipping him with a belt. That escalated quickly. 
<laughs> they're like, whoa, what just happened? That escalated really quickly. And then when Newt gets arrested, the wizarding world wants to put him to death. What? Like, are we doing a, a, a silly one for kids? Like the... Like, the, the stuff with Newt when he's catching him, that feels like the first one, two, three Harry Potter films. And then all the Credence, Grindelwald, Wizarding World stuff feels like the later Harry Potter films. And it can't decide the target audience. And it hurts the film. And there's a lot of good stuff in here. There's a lot of stuff about Newt that he could carry a fun, whimsical adventure for a younger audience. But nope. That's not what they decided to do. Number 19, Star Wars Solo. Now, this is a movie that doesn't need to exist, but that doesn't mean that there's not enjoyment to be had with it. It had an incredibly troubled production with Lord and Miller being the original people hired, which right out of the gate, you can see why that's a really bad idea to partner them with Lawrence Kesden, who's writing, working on the script. So they get fired. They bring in Ron Howard, who is actually a great yet conservative choice to direct a Star Wars movie, especially if you have Lawrence Kasdan writing it. And the final product is surprisingly coherent considering how troubled the production actually was. But does it need to exist? Uh, not really. Is it the best idea to recast Harrison Ford and some of these other characters? Probably not. But I actually feel this would have worked pretty well as a TV show. It's just kind of inherently a little bit episodic by nature of like, what was he up to when he was younger? Let's do a little train heist and there's other side to it. You can see how that there's a series of episodes in here and fun to be had. Like I, I enjoy this movie every time I watch it. It just feels so incredibly unnecessary at the same time. And had it been a TV show, you can even see at the end of it how there's more stories to be told and like plot threads that they leave hanging that you're like, oh, that, that could be interesting. So that's good. Nope. Doesn't look like we're going to see what's going to happen with any of those. So, you know, it's fine. It's enjoyable enough just doesn't need to exist. Next up, Fantastic Beast: The Secrets of Dumbledore. Now, after The Crimes of Grindelwald, my interest in this franchise had kind of like completely disappeared. The trailers for this movie didn't really win me over. I didn't really know what to expect going into the theater, and I was actually pleasantly surprised. It turned out to be like a political thriller set during World War II in the Wizarding World, which I wouldn't have ever thought to make a movie like that, but it kind of worked for me of taking these wizards and putting them on this different type of story that expands the wizarding world while um, fleshing out some of these characters that we already know and just doing something new and different in this franchise. So I dug all of those things about it. Now, still has a lot of the problems of the franchise of it's kind of about Newt tracking down his Fantastic Beasts, but it also tries to be this dark epic. Uh, I think Mads Mikkelsen is much better cast than Johnny Depp. Johnny Depp was horribly miscast. You don't believe him for one second as Dumbledore's lover, as this deep connection. Like, they're just too different. Johnny Depp's too weird for this very, like, classy Jude Law Dumbledore, and you believe it much more Mads Mikkelsen. So I actually dug this one. It's not fantastic. Doesn't live up to the, its title in that regard, but it's good. It's a nice addition that does something different, and I like it. Number 17, The Chronicles of Narnia, The Lion, The Witch, and The Wardrobe. Now, this is one of these movies where I never like it as much as I feel like I should or like I'm supposed to. As someone that is deeply soaked in church world there's a lot, a lot of love for the Chronicles of Narnia, C.S. Lewis, and in particular, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And it's one that I always enjoy, but when you take a book that is so much of Christian allegory, and you have Disney be the one to make it, and just all the condensing that happens anytime you take a book and you try and convert it into a movie... It just feels like some of the magic is lost in the process. It's good. It's nice to go into the world of Narnia. There's a lot of solid casting in here, like young James McAvoy in there. Just a lot of solid stuff in it. Also, they trimmed some things that probably shouldn't have trimmed. They added some things that they probably shouldn't have added, in which case, it's, it's solid, but it's not nearly as good as it probably should have been or could have been. Then we have 
Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. Now, this was actually my introduction to the wizarding world. Went to go see it with a girl, having not seen the Sorcerer's Stone, just went straight into this one. Didn't know exactly what was going on in the film, but I guess it was enjoyable enough. So this is where I first went into the wizarding world. And I, I think in a lot of ways, it actually does improve upon Sorcerer's Stone or Philosopher's Stone. I think it has a much better narrative that's interwoven throughout the entire story because you don't have to do all the setup. Everyone's kind of in place and you can get right to the adventure. And it has a payoff in the third act that's much better. But the problem I think we have here is that the shortest book is converted into the longest movie where it's almost just a translation of the book into a movie. And so at times it can drag a little bit, can feel a little bit stretched out. And because we've already been to the, the world of Harry Potter, um, some of that Don't magic and the newness isn't hands. quite there. It just feels like more of the first movie, better story, but maybe a little bit too long. Big standout here for me with this film is the addition of Dobby, who is the funniest character in all of Harry Potter, adds a real nice touch to things, and as well as, uh, was it Lucius Malfoy? Great antagonist thrown into the mix that helps you understand why his son is the way that he is. So it's another solid Harry Potter film, maybe just a bit too long. Number 15, The Chronicles of Narnia, Prince Caspian. Now, for me, I have read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe multiple times. I don't believe I've ever read Prince Caspian, so I can't really compare the book to the movie. So just watching it as a movie in and of itself, I felt like this one was able to have a more clear and focused narrative where right out of the gate, you know who our villain is, you know who our hero is, we know what our hero is trying to accomplish. We know why our villain is trying to do what he's trying to do. And it's a more action adventure based story. I like action. I like adventure. Therefore, it's just easier to me, for me to connect with this story than The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, the movies, I'm not tying the books in. And that's for me why I have this one just a little bit higher than that one. The story itself is just designed in a way that you know what we're doing, why we're doing it and we get to the action, the adventure, the conflicts more easily defined. That's what works for me here. Not not top tier by any means. I, I'm not crazy about any of the Narnia films, but a solid adventure. Number 14, Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. Now this is where the Harry Potter franchise really starts to get into motion where Voldemort, actually make appears in the flesh, starts doing some really evil things, killing Batman himself. But more importantly, this is a coming of age story where you start to see the transition from our heroes being children in the first three, and now they're in that awkward teenage stage, slowly growing up. And that leads to a bunch of stuff in this movie that if you've seen my, some of my previous rankings of Harry Potter, I've sometimes had this one really low <laughs> different times, different things annoy me in different amounts. And they're in a phase of life where they can be very frustrating because they have so much teen angst. And uh, so I had it really low. I think I had it at the bottom of one of my rankings and people just thrashed me for that. I was like, why is that? Let me think about that. So I spent a lot of time reflecting. And I was like, okay, that's, that's intentional. That's what's supposed to be there. That's what that phase of life is like. Okay, all right. It actually captures properly the energy that's there and there is a story here of that journey of Harry step slowly stepping into leadership in a more prominent way and some of the consequence that comes out with his friendships and finding first love all of that's present and so uh, like at reading your comments processing what you're saying it's like okay I, yeah I was wrong <laughs> I had a weird take in one of my rankings on this one so come around a little bit more on it or quite a bit more on it then we have Star Wars The Force Awakens. And this is a movie that had I done this ranking a few years back, it would have been much higher up on this list. But with how the sequel trilogy ended, kind of soured me on the whole, whole trilogy where clearly they had no plan and they set up some things in this movie that were never paid off. They set up th some things that the way they paid it off is like, oh, I don't like that. 
That was not a great direction to take this. In which case, it sours you on this movie because you watch and see all the potential and you know it doesn't go where it's supposed to go. And there's some other things with this movie that just feel like really odd choices where you kill off Han before he's ever able to reunite with Luke and you never have that big three joining back together. That was just a really strange choice that why would you bring back the legacy characters that everyone loves their camaraderie and not give them a single scene together. That's bizarre. That is a strange choice that I would love to have like a sit down with the screenwriters, Kathleen Kennedy, JJ, have them explain how you could fail to do that. And so with time, you realize all the, the missed opportunities. All that said, it's a really fun roller coaster ride. J.J. Abrams has many faults as a director and as a storyteller, but what he's able to do is set up this roller coaster ride that once it gets going, it doesn't let up. Every time the, the plot slows down, he throws a joke in there to put a smile on your face. Maybe some cheap joke, but it makes me laugh nonetheless. And so he just knows how to make movies that move very quickly, keep you entertained. Six years to reflect on it, it's incredibly disappointing what they decided to do with Star Wars. Kathleen Kennedy, how could you not have a plan? How could you not do better than this? Number 12, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone or Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, or as my notes say, Harry Potter and the Socceroos Stone. I don't know why I wrote that in my notes, but it was funny to read right before I started talking just now. And what this movie does so well is be a great introduction to the wizarding world and to our characters. The plot itself about the Sorcerer's Stone is like an afterthought in the movie. It's not introduced until like 90 minutes into the movie and they just kind of like stumble into the plot line. That's not really what makes this movie special. It's journeying into this world for the first time with Harry Potter. As he discovers this world, we discover this world. And with John Williams' score and Christopher Columbus's knack for directing child actors, you just feel the magic come alive as we go into this world and are introduced to all these interesting characters, situations. That's the appeal of this movie. Now, there's some special effects that are kind of dated. There's some acting that's not the best from some of our child actors. No, you've made a mistake. I mean, I can't be a, a, a wizard. Luckily, they were able to get better as they went along, but... I think this is a solid first adventure into this world. Number 11, Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers. For me, this has always been the weakest of the Lord of the Rings trilogy, simply because it has the problem of being the, the middle chapter. I love first chapters in trilogies because they introduce us to the world, set us off on an adventure, and then the third chapter I normally love because it's all the payoff. You get all the satisfaction of everything coming to a close, but the tricky one is usually that middle chapter because we're just in the middle of the journey. It's bridging the beginning and the end, but it's not coming to a specifically satisfying conclusion, and it's a little bit what I feel like with this film. Now, granted, it's number 11 on a list of 31 films, so it's still a rock solid film. It's not a bad film by any stretch of the imagination. And there's some amazing things in here. Battle of Helm's Deep, fantastic, fantastic battle where you see our, the Fellowship of the Ring characters outside of our hobbits really forming that friendship, that camaraderie, the competitiveness. It's such a great extended sequence with so many fantastic elements to it with uh, all the new characters, returning characters, everything about it is amazing. The movie as a whole adds some new characters into the mix, uh, fleshes out the conflict. Like I said, not a bad film by any stretch of the imagination, just the one that for me, uh, in and of itself as a standalone film, has the least satisfying albums. Also, I'd say the Ents in general, I've always thought it, the visuals look off about it where almost everything in these three films holds up really well. I don't think the Ents hold up all that well. And the timeline of the movie, I don't think it captures how much time is passing as well as it probably should. But overall, like I said, it's very good film. Fits the trilogy. It's not like the bad one in there. It's just of the three in one of the greatest trilogies of all time is one of the weakest. It's the weakest for me, at least. Bringing us into the top 10, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of 
Azkaban, the third trip to Hogwarts, take things in a new direction and has a more focused story. Now, I'm always a sucker for time travel stories, in which case, a Harry Potter time travel story is one that I'm going to thoroughly enjoy, especially whenever you start like retracking over stuff that's previously happened. I always love that stuff, and it just makes for a fun addition to the Harry Potter world. But the real standout here is director Alfonso Caron, who just brings such a distinct style and flavor to this film, where amongst all of them, this is the one with the most distinct way that everything is captured with the best eye for the shots and quirky weird details and the way things are visualized it just brings everything to life in addition we get more great side characters in particular Gary Oldman as Sirius Black just such a nice new character who there's a mystery to him that pays off really well and becomes very important in the story over the next few films and so you got a great story you got great direction one of the best movies in the Harry Potter franchise and of course many of you would say it is the best film in the Harry Potter franchise and sometimes I've had it at the top of my ranking in my most recent rewatch there's three of them all all kind of tied for different reasons. I have them in that top three and they're, they're all really close to each other. Number nine, Star Wars Revenge of the Sith. Now this is a movie that I has slowly grown on me over the last 17 years. At the point in time where I first saw it in the theater, I was a cynical person in my early 20s, so frustrated by the prequels that all I could see were the bad aspects of it. I remember as an immature person in my early 20s laughing out loud when Vader went, no! And that was like my lingering memory about the film for a long time. With the passage of time, I can actually appreciate the film a whole lot more and the things that really work. Because when this movie works, it's some of the best Star Wars that we've ever gotten. It's certainly some of the best Star Wars that George Lucas ever directed. When Order 66 goes down, it's absolutely gut-wrenching, heartbreaking. Um, as you just see, this whole thing collapse. John Williams' score is absolutely magical. The final battle between Obi-Wan and Anakin, another just heartbreaking sequence brought to life by the score and just phenomenal choreography. It's big, it's epic, it's operatic, it's all the things it's supposed to be. I, I never can have this one as absolutely top tier Star Wars because I just have, can't buy into the wet mechanism, the plot devices that they use to turn Anakin about just believing in this Sith force that will bring protect Padme from dying. I, I just don't buy into it. The way that Anakin goes in the course of 12 minutes of screen time from, oh no, Palpatine is a Sith, to kneeling before him and then slaughtering children. It's just too sudden. It's, it's not an arc. It's just an immediate hard U-turn in the opposite direction, way far in the opposite direction. So it, if, if only there'd been a better mechanism of, of change, better explanation for why that felt more earned rather than just like, whoa, and some details in there where just Anakin just feels too whiny, where he's it, like gifted some incredible privileges above anyone else and all he can see is the thing to complain about. Just those details with Anakin, whatever it was that Lucas couldn't write Anakin right, it's just so frustrating because it was so close to Fantastic Star Wars, but not quite there. Number eight, Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix. Now, this was a Harry Potter film where I felt like everything started coming together. The thing that I always wanted is this, you keep telling me how great Harry Potter is, and finally in this one, he becomes this leader that sees everything wrong with his wizarding world. If the adults aren't gonna do something about it, he's gonna do something about it. Add to that, you got a great villain in Umbridge who is just like perfectly designed to be the absolute worst in a way that uh, is a character you love to hate. Now, this is one where you can feel them condensing a book this big into a film this long, but it works. It's condensed in a way where I could follow everything. It gives me all the information I need to track along with it. And there's ways to do it that you can actually see them condensing it, but it not hurt the story. And for me, that's what happens with this one. And because you give me a villain you want to see overthrown in Umbridge, when the twins like rebel against her, it's so satisfying. When we have our final showdown, 
you feel the payoff of all the work that Harry's been doing. There's tragedy, there's loss. So it's all the things that I want from a fantasy adventure in this film and where like Harry Potter really started to come to life for me. Next up, Star Wars Rogue One. And for me, with several years to reflect on it, this is the best of the Disney era of Star Wars. Whereas the sequel trilogy, I think was just hurt by a lack of plan to where two of those movies, I just don't think work. And the one that does work hasn't aged very well because all the stuff set up and it isn't paid off well. Then with Solo, I don't think it was a great idea for the movie in the first place. So it was enjoyable. It was a, an enjoyable execution of a not great idea for a movie. This is actually an interesting idea for a movie executed well. And it's a little bit more mature because it's about a crew of people that are all going to die. But it fills out a little bit of a gap in the story mythology where we actually get to see the rebellion before our new hope emerges. We get to see what was it like for these people that are just like this ragtag group trying to fight back against the government and kind of understand where the Death Star came from, how big of a threat it was, and all the actual cost that led to A New Hope, which is a very fun, quick-moving story, but has a bleak, dark story right before it that led to those plans being available for Luke to be able to destroy this thing. And so I think, as I said before, this is the movie where they were trying to put the war back into Star Wars. I think they succeeded at it. And considering it's a movie that had a very troubled production, it had massive reshoots where someone came in to basically rewrite the movie and reshoot the movie. It's surprisingly coherent. It works. I'd love to see what that original cut of the film was, but this to me is the best Disney Star Wars movie that they put out that works and it has an incredibly satisfying third act and an amazing Vader sequence to close it out. Number six, Lord of the Rings, Fellowship of the Rings. And of course, this is one of the great trilogies of all time, in which case the first story in the trilogy is the one that has all the weight of building out the world, setting up all the characters, and it just does a great job of it. Whether you're talking about the prologue that gives you all the backstory about Middle-earth and the importance of these rings, to showing us the hobbits in the Shire and how mundane their lives are, to the transition into the adventure and how important it is that um, Frodo succeed on the mission that he's on all of it works. It introduces us to a series of complex characters that actually feel like they have multiple layers to them where they have competing value sets, different motivations for what they're doing, and that's what makes them interesting. And they're all crammed together into this fellowship, sent on this adventure to try and save Middle Earth. They have flaws, they have great character qualities, they have all of it, and that's what makes it compelling. Um, it's it's not just random characters and stereotypes. They're actual characters with diverse, different backgrounds on an exciting adventure. So our introduction to Middle Earth is just a, a, a great classic adventure story. In fifth place, Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 2. If Part 1 suffered from being all set up and having this meandering plot, Part 2 benefits from being all payoff and being very focused on bringing this big saga to a close, in which case every one of our characters gets their moment to finish out their journey. Sometimes that means characters dying. Sometimes that means nerdy, weak characters from the first film standing up to Voldemort in front of a crowd. I didn't die in vain, but you will, because you're wrong. And of course it means we get our final showdown between Harry Potter and Voldemort. Uh, all of it is exactly what you want. It's satisfying, it's big, it's epic, and all of it feels earned because we've been on this long eight film journey that's led to this point in time. So for me, as someone that loves payoff, loves satisfying conclusions, 
This to me was the best of the Harry Potter films, at least on my most recent rewatch. In fourth place, Lord of the Rings Return of the King. Speaking of satisfying conclusions and massive payoff, this is three plus hours of all payoff on multiple levels and done in a way where everything feels earned and there's always contrast. So you have one king fail miserably and another step up to the plate. You have a son make a desperate attempt to please his father while you have a niece go against her king's wishes because it's the right thing to do. You have friendships challenged. You have the... Frodo as the supposed hero of our hobbits, but Sam proves himself to be the real hero. Not that Frodo's a bad guy or anything, but the, the ring takes a toll on him and Sam steps up to be the real king and all of it. All of it is so satisfying. It's truly epic. It's filled with emotion. It has massive, gigantic battle sequences. Now, maybe it has seven conclusions too many, but who's counting and who cares? Because... It's actually bringing everything to a close after this epic, epic journey that we've been on. I've said it a thousand times before. I'm not someone that naturally gravitates towards Lord of the Rings, but that doesn't mean that it's not a great trilogy of films, and it doesn't mean that this isn't an amazing epic conclusion. It is, and that's why it's high on this list. Real quick, before I give you my top three, remember to join me down below in the comment section. Share your ranking of all 31 films, or as many as you have seen. My list is not the right list. You've probably already figured that out because you've disagreed with me a lot up to this point in time. It's just my list, and I'd love to see yours. Also, as this is part of the Autop stream, Cody Leach and Brian Lomax have also shared their videos. Be sure to go check them out once this video is over with. And also, we've done a bunch of these 31 on 31s before. You can check out the ones I've participated in in this playlist right up here. In third place, Star Wars Return of the Jedi. The closeout of the original trilogy of Star Wars films is a big, epic showdown film. The plot itself, pretty thin, but it's designed to deliver character moments and spectacular action sequences. So you get this amazing throne room scene that is all about a father and a son, a son who so believes is still hopeful that he can redeem his father despite his father being absolutely the worst villain in the galaxy maybe second worst villain in the galaxy because Palpatine is a pretty awful person and Luke through all his, of his hopefulness is able to redeem even Darth Vader and bring back Anakin Skywalker all along the way you just get some spectacular action sequences I to this day believe that the space battles in Return of the Jedi are the greatest space battles that have ever been put to film. And even within them, you get the continued redemption of Lando Calrissian, who takes over part of this rebellion and leads the charge against the Death Star. So for me, I don't care about the Ewoks. Some people like make a big deal about how would they be able to overpower the stormtroopers. It's a classic story trope of the primitive force going up against the more advanced army. It's Avatar, it's Dances with Wolves, it's Pocahontas, and it's Return of the Jedi, so it doesn't bother me whatsoever that they did that. Um, so I grew up with the Ewoks. They've never bothered me. This is just an emotionally satisfying conclusion to the original trilogy with some amazing action. Our runner-up, Star Wars, the original 1977 film that kicked off the entire trilogy. And it is just a special film that marked a change in cinema where George Lucas just kind of invented this whole world that was heavily inspired by all the films that he loved, all the fantasy that he loved. It was his own version of Flash Gordon, but it was its all new thing in and of itself. He wrote years worth of drafts where his friends were like, this is too weird, make it more mainstream. And by the time that he delivered the final product, it was a new version of classic mythology that was unlike anything we had ever seen before. And it's so easy to forget that when the original Star Wars came out, it was an all new thing. 
It wasn't a franchise. It was just this original story called Star Wars that had revolutionary special effects, thrilling dogfights in space, laser swords, an amazing set of characters. And when you rewatch it now, parts of it haven't aged the best, even if you watch the special edition. Actually, if you watch the special edition, that's even a new way in which it doesn't age all that well. Um, but the most important things about it age wonderfully. And as you move into the back half and the crew gets together, it's just so much fun. It's so satisfying when you get to the end. It's just classic, great. It's a classic, great thrill ride of an adventure that kickstarted an amazing fan fantasy and an incredible mythology. But in first place is Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back, a movie that takes everything that was great about the original and takes the next step. The special effects are better. The music is even more magical and the characters more developed and taken on a greater journey. It's a classic coming of age story where Luke Skywalker trains with Yoda and learns the ways of the force and he's challenged, he's tempted to go save his friends and he fails the temptation and thus loses the battle and loses his hand in the process. It's a blockbuster where the good guys lose in the end and they have to regroup and rally again and hope that maybe they can come back and be victorious in their next adventure. It's a movie that adds comple complexity to even the villains where Darth Vader was just this menacing force in the original Star Wars, and now he's given a backstory that ties back to our hero in an interesting way where he wants to recruit his son to turn against the Emperor. All of it takes everything to the next level, makes everything just a little bit better. There's just so many fantastic sequences, like where the Millennium Falcon is flying through an asteroid field, and in and of itself, it's just groundbreaking in with the special effects, what they were able to do, but it's just elevated by what John Williams brought to the film. To me, this is the best of Star Wars, where everything came together. For me, this is the best of Star Wars, that it just takes you off into this other world with a set of fantastic characters who learn, grow, fail all along the way. It's exciting and it just sucks you in. So for me, it's one of my absolute favorite movies of all time. So it comes in at number one. If you enjoyed this video, remember to check out Cody Leach and Brian Lomax's videos. Actually, I don't know where they are at, but we all did this series together, so be sure to support the other channels, watch their videos, like, subscribe to their channels. Also, I've done some of these other 31 on 31s with them before. You can check that out also in this playlist somewhere around here. Thank you so much for watching, and keep talking movies too much.